thought. Okay, let's hit play. And now we are recording. We're here live. All right. Wait for the little dumb Zoom prompt to get out of the way. Okay, let's minimize that. And we'll minimize this. Okay. So, whoops. This is up on the up on the course website. The slides are. I just posted them about I don't know half an hour ago. You're probably going to want to go to it. Um, this is a brand new slide deck for me to put together in general, so it's pretty effing detailed uh, oriented. But so we're going to change gears dramatically from where we've been the previous five weeks here. Um, so we're going to shift into our discussion of content management systems and things that leverage SQL and um, uh, structured data. So <clears throat> before that, just a real rapid critique wrap up of last assignment. Um, so a lot of you picked normalization, seemed to be a common understanding of how to normalize away uh, data that's basically implying the same thing. So a lot of you had, for example, like a region or hospital location, something like that. And a lot of those ended up having a zip code and like, this is in the United States. And obviously if you have a zip code, then you're already in the United States. So um, kudos to a, a bunch of people made that, made that direction. A, a couple of you even pointed out, if we already have a, a field name zip code, it implies this is a US only database system, which is kind of true. Because uh, zip codes are not called zip codes in other countries, even though they have similar types of things. So um, good work on alter statements. I saw everybody that attempted alters to get them to work correctly. Um, and just making sure that people hit two normal forms of data, uh, which everybody pretty much did. On the SQL injection front, several of you did this one too. Um, this was one of the more creative ones. I hadn't actually thought of this one. Um, is you can issue, I think it's two dashes in a SQL command and it'll uh, comment out the rest of the line. And so if you issued a comment, you could basically inject your brand new command at the front and then comment out all the rest of the garbage after it. Um, two people were actually able to successfully inject into the database. Everyone that did this was able to explain it and hook it up to their database, which is great. But two of you actually were able to legitimately inject data into it. So kudos to you. Um, and then one person pointed out, you'd never want a super admin account just to do an insert as it has too many permissions, um, which is not something we really talked about, but that's a good like um, security policy type of a thing, right? If you, have an, if you have a call that you know is only gonna do an insert of data, you probably should use an, a user account that can only insert data. Then if, you, if the, it got hacked, or hacked air quotes, um, the injection attempt would only be able to insert more data. It wouldn't be able to read it, wouldn't be able to dump everything. So, and then one person made a Django app. I don't know who that is, <laughs> Jonah, but um, so uh, that was a great example and you just, you know, talk through it after that. I have actually passed that example on to some friends I have in administration um, because they haven't looked at Django working before. Um, and it's a good example of like, here's why we should probably teach Python. So uh, now we start uh, Super CMS land, which as all of you know, when you got your Game Boy, not Game Boy Advance or DS, but original Game Boy in 1989, all of you were alive, I'm assured. Um, and so this was like the very first game I got. So this is a talk for me, screw all of you. I don't care what age demographic you are, okay? This is Super Mario Land, the correct version from 1989. Anyway, uh, so my bias in this area, and I do this specifically with the CMS things, because this is the field that I work in heavily. So my team builds two of these projects who will be mentioned today. Uh, one is Hack CMS and one is called Hacks Levendy. Um, our course website is actually built on Hack CMS. So if you go to any, if you've gone to the course website, congratulations, you're actually participating in the class. But if you load anything, jump around and it seems like it loads fast, you should just tell me, wow, I really love how fast this course website is. Why do we pay millions of dollars for Canvas? And then I'll say, you know what? You should bring that up with the university. That's a really great point. Um, because then a student will have made the request. Anyway, um, so this is really starting to touch on what my area of expertise is in working on the web um, in building really fast uh, tools that empower more people to be creative on the web. So 
if you're interested in any of these topics, you know, because this is just the tip of the iceberg, um, you can go to bit.ly slash hackslack and it'll dump you into our Slack channel that our team works in. We work with a couple other institutions as well. Um, so good job opportunity potentially, or even just contributing to open source, getting your name out there. So I also have written plugins for Grav and Eleventy, which we'll also talk about today. And I don't actually use Doxify or Jekyll, uh, which is part of why they're not focused on nearly as much in this presentation. There's also a lot of other topics that do things called static site generation. So I don't wanna say that this is everything. It's just the things I have the most experience with. So adding to our potential resume bullet points, there's a lot of them today. So uh, 11D is really hot right now, particularly with Google engineers. I don't understand why. Um, so if you can even get some minor experience with 11D, like throw up a site and get another resume bullet point, maybe someone in the web industry would be like, oh, you know what 11D is. Uh, start a conversation from there. Same with uh, Doxify, Jekyll, any of the others. So uh, first off, let's start with what is a content management system or CMS. So a CMS boiled way down is just a way of organizing and delivering content of known or unknown structure on the internet. So if any of, if any of you use WordPress, wordpress.com or sites.psu.edu, um, or administered like a club website or something, you probably are somewhat familiar with a, what a CMS gives you. It lets you build a website out, basically clicking through a UI and saying, here's my page content. Um, so typically it's built on a lot of abstractions uh, which help with security. Um, most of the most popular ones are open source. And so you get this community looking at the code and, and ultimately making more secure things. Even if last uh, class with SQL injection, I did mention Drupal, having a massive attack, uh, but that's rare. So typically they're multi-user involvement. So imagine you're working on a website for a client, that client has 50 people that are gonna be contributing news articles or something, right? That's typically where a CMS comes in versus just building uh, a static website, right? Community is actually contributing to and building out, populating the content, generally speaking. Uh, so some data formats for today that we'll at least glance through. Uh, HTML, short for Hypertext Markup Language. So this is what every web page is made out of. We're gonna look at some JSON, uh, which is short for JavaScript Object Notation, because that rolls right off the tongue. And then about 500 different formats of developers later, uh, there's this super trolly one that I love, that's just YAML. And it's sh originally short for yet another markup language. As in you'd say it like, yeah, I know, it's yet another way of marking up material. Um, but they actually changed the name to make people even more angry. So it's recursive. It's YAML ain't markup language. And I had to actually look this up that that is the phrase that they use, that YAML is short for YAML ain't markup language. So that you're always going YAML ain't markup language. Oh, but you use the word in the definition. So what does that mean? Oh, well, YAML ain't markup language. And you just keep recursively doing it. It's a very trolly thing I wanted to point out. So HTML in one slide, because this is not a web course, I highly recommend you take web courses either here or online. Um, so HTML is what's structuring the document. You're gonna see brackets, you're gonna see uh, some attributes in between that define it and you ultimately are gonna get content. CSS is gonna give you some styling to content and then JavaScript is what's gonna actually provide the interactivity. It's gonna be in the example of our course website when you click on a link, JavaScript is what activates the fact that the link should go and make a request to reload the content of the page. It's way more complicated than than that, but that's basically breaking down these three things. Uh, that you get interactivity, the way something looks, and the structure of the thing. That's basically every website you've ever gone to in one slide. So looking at the Penn State website, if you were to right click and inspect and view source, and you would click on the hideous gopher icon, um, you could actually change it to say logo, and I highly encourage you to do this, instead of logo new.png, and you'll get the original Penn State logo on psu.edu instead of the dumpster fire logo that we use today. But this is HTML, right? JSON looks like this. So JSON blobs of data, and actually one of the field storage mechanisms we had was JSON or blob, is effectively an, a notation that says, hey, this is an object, and it has an ID, and the ID equals this value. It has the word indent equals this value. And you can do numerical storage. It also can nest hierarchically forever. So in this case, you see there's metadata 
and metadata has an open and closed bracket. That just means this is open for other object notation. So I think I have, uh, now later on we'll look at a more, a more complex one. But, um, and then the trolley YAML format generally looks like this. Um, so part of the reason why people like YAML and are starting to gravitate to it more is there's a lot less syntax, right? So in the case of JSON, if I miss one single quotation mark or a comma, it's not valid JSON, it breaks. Now YAML, obviously I can make invalid YAML, but you see the only real notation is spacing and um, uh, colon. So name, colon, whatever, and it goes, oh, you mean text, right? There's no brackets around it. There's no quotation marks. Version, oh, and a number, it knows this is numeric. There's no quotations around it. There's no 1.0 is different from quote 1.0 and all the silly type stuff we talked about um, previously. And then if I want an array or a list of options, I just do a hyphen and a space. So this is also really popular because at some level it kind of feels like Markdown. If you've written things in Markdown, like for your dev.2 articles and you want a bulleted list, you just do a hyphen space type of a thing. So it's gaining popularity rather rapidly, I'd say the last three years over JSON because of just, it's much easier to read what's going on here. So this leads me to the anti-database movement. And you go, why are we talking about the anti-database movement when this is a database class? Well, there's lots of ways to structure and deliver information out there. So um, SQL statements are portable, right? You were able to run a call and you could see the output and go, oh, I can write a select. And then I know how to select that data. And if it's an insert, you go, oh, well, here's the insert. And actually, if, you, if any of you hit the export button, it will give you statements that would recreate your entire database. But most people wouldn't really say that that's actually portable, right? That makes sense if you know how to run a database, how to run a web server, how to be a database administrator, have access to it, know what export is, and then know what you're importing on the other side. That's a lot of steps, even just for a novice or intermediate user. Also, if you're trying to do deployments, right? If you're trying to take those files, you have the files of your website, which could be our db.php file or whatever, you copy and paste that somewhere else, it's there. How do you get the database there? That's the, that's the open-ended question for a lot of people. How do you get the data there, right? If you have to actually migrate that data, there is a whole process involved and scripts that have to be written to actually do deployments. So as a result of this, especially a lot of indie web type of users, like people making their own web content, they don't wanna go through all of that BS just to get some text on the internet. Like that's pretty aggressive. So what they've, started to find their way towards is forming data structures out of the file system and the files itself. So having maybe a folder that says pages. And then in pages, if there's page one.md, that becomes the first page of whatever the website is. So this is a, an interesting way of, of structuring data. Uh, it's by no means invented by Paul Hibbets, but he's a, a colleague of mine that I collaborate with, um, chat on, AKA chat on Twitter. That's how you have collaborators. And, modern web development is you've had a conversation on Twitter and now you're BFFs. Um, but Paul's doing some really interesting work uh, and makes good visuals in this area. So I will say my team sees value in both. So we play with, you know, anti-database static content driven systems and heavily entrenched database systems. So um, I'd say the main difference is if you have a site that's for one person or it has to be super high fidelity, it's not actually modified by the client and you're doing all the work, Maybe a static site is the way to go. It's really easy to hand off. They're usually ultra fast. Um, but if you actually have to give a site to someone where other people are adding and creating the content, then that's probably where we're talking a database. It has user management, has the ability to collaborate, and multiple people submit work. So we're gonna be looking at those in the next two weeks. We'll look at WordPress and Drupal coming up. So um, this is an interesting visual that Paul has. He's got two of them here. So. He uses a platform called Grab, and Grab is a static, it's not a static site generator, but it's a flat file system based uh, CMS. It's in, a unique being in the universe of the web. But so the way that Paul envisions someone working with this is if you have people that want to edit content on a website, they write Markdown and they can push it up to GitHub or in putting it in version control, or they can use, uh, Grab has like a nice UI we'll take a look at, it'll be one of the options of the lab. And you can edit via the UI, much like a wordpress.com type environment. But what you're ultimately editing is just the front end interface making Git commits. 
and it's touching physical files on your behalf so that then when the site is actually rendered to someone, Grav looks at the file system, takes the content of the page and just presents it to the end user. So it's a, an interesting way of being able to take content from many people and deploy it out to the internet um, without, for example, the, the Django app that Jonah showed actually requires a running web server to do the Python processing to deliver the front end and to make the saves and deliver the back end, right? Grav has this as well, it's PHP based, but it's physically writing to files. You can actually just open the file. There's no database there. Um, so it's a lot easier to piece through. Another way he has of looking at this is as a pyramid, and it's in this way of making content that's future friendly. Now, Paul's focus is on uh, open educational resources, which we'll touch on uh, later in the semester. My course is technically an OER course because all the material is open. But his, um, his goal with this is uh, asking the philosophical question of, am I going to be teaching or using this content next year? Will I have to make decisions based on technology at that time? Okay, can I guarantee that the technology decision I make today will guarantee my content just works next year? So you might just leave a system in stasis and be like, hey, I have a website, it works. I have to update my content. I update my content every semester. I've written other courses previously. So that content has to live on. And I need it in a format that I can easily move between environments. Otherwise I'm rewriting my entire website every time, which is stupid. Or I'm just uploading PDFs into Canvas, which is the alternative that a lot of people unfortunately do. So what Paul's come up with is this notion of having your content in a physical file, right? So he has a skeleton, skeleton starting point course, whatever. So you have an actual physical file like default.md and that is where all your content lives. It's in its purest form. So looking at that content, it's actually written in Markdown. Um, so several of you have been using more advanced aspects of Markdown. Um, it's interpreted HTML or it gets interpreted as HTML. Um, so if it's his idea is if it's in this format, it's structureless, it's something he can easily pick up, copy and paste, send to a colleague, like a normal person can edit this file, right? I don't need advanced database technology to just modify this data. So then he could open that up in a code editor. So I have VS Code here, right? And VS Code will give me some niceties like syntax highlighting. Um, as a minor thing, but it, again, it's still just that file. It's still in Markdown. It's a pure format. And then if you, if you start putting that pure format into more advanced things, for example, if you use uh, actions on GitHub, GitHub has this uh, thing called actions where you can tell GitHub, hey, uh, every time I make a change, I want you to run this series of tasks. And so you can actually have GitHub do all your building of a website, taking your files from Markdown and building a website out of them with like two commands. So you can do it that way, or he could be like, well, I have my content, it's up on in Grav. I'm gonna use an interface that edits the Markdown. But fundamentally, no matter how he goes about editing this, it's still Markdown, right? It's still free of a database. It's not actually in any real structured form. That's the idea. So, there is a structure though, powering grab, it's kind of interesting. So in grab, when you hit save, it's actually going into a folder, in this case, like user slash pages, and it's making a folder with the name of the page you're saving. So, and it's in this case, this is actually a really big flaw of grab in my opinion, but if you want a page to be the fourth page in a menu, it actually num numbers the folder on the file system 04.0 and then the name of whatever the page is. So it's a little small here, but it says that the, the title of this page is content in grav. And so it makes an associated folder called content hyphen in hyphen grav. And then in that folder, it makes a default.md, which then has the body of content written into it. So it's kind of a database in that way, right? It's on the file system, based on the way the file system is structured, you can have data get retrieved from it. Um, it also has this part that I think I have a slide for later, uh, which is called head matter or front matter. This is where you can actually start to store structured data in this flat format in, in written in YAML. But so ultimately what gets rendered is, hey, there's I can write headings and it's that content, but it's taking the markdown and making it HTML. So a static site generator um, is something that takes files, 
know, location on the file system, runs a job, and then out the other side, you have a, wor a real working website. It's made meaning out of that data. So typically, this takes place in like a data or a pages folder. There's a consistent location. You can just dump all your content and then run a job and magically you get a website. And a lot of them do use the word magically, like the magical disappearing site generator, because the idea is that you really don't make a lot of changes. You just edit your content directly and then maybe say like, I want to use this theme and it figures it out. Um, so these pages are typically stored as like page.md or default.html, something like that. And in the case of MD, it can actually have front matter uh, or um, uh, head matter. People kind of use the terms interchangeably. But what that is, is this portion at the top of the file, right? Think of this as almost a tuple in a database. So you've got a record and the record's primary key is the title of the page. But then you actually have fields attached to this that you can define at will. So I can put title content in grav and then I've stored the actual title in a variable called title. I could write, you know, numbers or anything else there. As long as it's valid YAML, it's going to actually work. So um, some of the pros of static site generators and why these have taken off, probably in the last five years, I'd say they're really taken off. Um, it's just the notion of taking a folder on your computer or that's, you know, out on a, on a web server and zipping it and handing it to another person and they have the whole website. There's no, how do I get all the dependencies for that? How do I set up this website? Oh, what type of database, you know, system did you use? Oh, this has PHP behind it. Oh, our server only supports Python. All those decision trees go out the window. Um, you're just working with files that a script runs and generates the website for you. So uh, communities are also starting to pop up around these. Um, so they supply some plugins and themes. So all the ones I'm going to cover and all the major ones that gain any traction are open source. Many of them are Node.js based, but we don't care about that for the moment. Um, so it's easy to load these things into like GitHub or GitLab, which is a competitor to GitHub, um, and have an automated job just do the web, build the website for you. So then the other thing is really easy to update content once you know the pattern. So once you've looked at an 11 site, you know what the structure of every 11 site is. Same with Jekyll, same with HackCMS, same with grab. So that's another advantage of them. Some of the cons though are um, I'm just throwing out there like, oh, and there's a script that runs. The, there is magic involved and a lot of people don't like that. <laughs> there's also the need to run tooling or issue commands from the command line. And I'm sure all of your parents in their daily lives are comfortable running and opening the terminal and issuing commands, right? Because I mean, mine totally are, right? So it's, it's very limiting in who it's potential target audiences, right? It's, we're talking developers that can build content rapidly, manage it on their own, someone that's comfortable with the command line. It's important, especially with CMSs and as you get into the product space of thinking like, who is the target market for this? Um, I still have a faculty member, friend of mine who builds things in Jekyll and then tells me it's really easy to use. And I'm like, you're right, it is really easy for me to use. Now explain it to other faculty that don't know what a terminal prompt is. Like that's, it's, so know, know who your audience is here. But um, there are some nuanced differences between the various ones that can be confusing. They're also very poor at dynamic uh, data. So this is not for something where you're having a form that someone can insert, uh, you know, COVID metrics into. It's not, it's not for that. It's for pre-built, predefined content structure run some command and magically content comes out the other side. Um, there's also no user accounts, generally speaking, and maybe there's a login system for like one person to manage. Uh, of these things we'll look at, Grav is the only one that, well, no, sorry, Grav and Hack CMS are the only ones that have login systems. So the first one is uh, called Jekyll. So Jekyll is kind of an older static site generator. It's one of the first ones that got really popular. Um, so Jekyll RB, the RB being short for Ruby, which, you know, speaking to older, please do not build things in Ruby on Rails. I'm just going to say it right now. Um, but so you can check out JekyllRB.com. Um, GitHub actually has a priority on using this. So you can build a website very rapidly just through the UI using it. But uh, so it's command line oriented. Um, the end user is a developer that wants to rapidly build and ship a website. Files are all stored locally. It uh, allows you to use something called liquid templating, 
which allows you to write things like this. So you can actually put logic in your markdown files, um, which again, thinking of who the audience is, right? We're getting into complexities uh, even beyond like, hey, I just wanna edit the content of the file here. Um, so it is a, a more advanced audience. Um, it's slightly dated, but I mean, these approaches work forever because they're static site oriented. So here's an example website. Um, my friend made this uh, for SIGGRAPH one year. So it's just a basic website has structure across the top and content of the page. But the thing that actually powers this page is, uh, um, in this case, it says it's an HTML file, but actually it was operating like a markdown file. So it has head matter at the top saying, hey, have a header or enable the banner. And so these attributes at the front of it, kind of like a tuple in a database, right? Tell the static site generator, oh, you should allow for the banner image to be shown in this theme. Now there's some advanced logic at play here for sure, but you're actually able to have the content dictate how the theme generates the, the material for it. So you can see there's mentor me written down here and then down in the page, um, no, he actually has some pretty advanced logic here. I didn't see what he had written for this. So um, Jekyll is a, a bit more advanced than some of the other ones we'll look at, but um, there's a config file that's in YAML that dictates the entire structure of the site, right? So all the pages that you can go to in that website have a thing called menu items. And then under menu items, it says, hey, this is the URL. So it's gonna go find that static file, load the contents and present the contents on the screen and it's gonna be home. So this is kind of like a hierarchy and a, a, you know, this menu structure as to how this content is related. Um, you can just edit files on the file system. So if you wanna add a new uh, site or a new page to this website, you just create a folder under programs and then you title it whatever you want and the static site generator will notice that file exists and now add, to, add it to the website. So I mentioned that's the head matter, front matter, it's written in YAML here. You can see that there's a title programs. And because of that, you get this big programs written on the screen. And that would allow someone to update that part of a file. The, you know, the job runs back through and now out the other side, we get whatever the new thing is. So um, then to build and deploy this site, and I said, it's magic. Um, they have like, hey, copy and paste this. So yes, you do need to understand how to install, in this case, Ruby initially, um, but you can see Jekyll comes with a, a single command that basically just takes the file structure and builds a website. So Jekyll's kind of been usurped in, in more recent times by something called Levendy. Um, and I'd say Levendy's gotten popular mostly in the last like two years. Uh, I, had, I had never heard of it prior to about a year ago, but um, so Levendy, is uh, so hot right now as a Zoolander reference. Again, I like to have topical references from movies that are older than most of the people taking this class. So um, it's command line based tooling that's um, uh, centric to the site creator. It's again, it's for one person. Um, there's no front end interface for it, just purely editing files. And it's very easy to extend, um, but very difficult to use initially in my opinion, uh, because it makes almost no opinions. Um, and this is part of why it's, it's gaining so much traction, is if you know any uh, templating language, uh, which there are lots of them, uh, it will work in Eleventy. So if you've written content uh, for, you know, for a random Drupal project and you had to write a front end theme, you could probably mash it up with content that you wrote in Jekyll five years earlier with very little changes to it. Um, and again, you run a command and you get these published fully static HTML files. So um, for example, they're docs and it's important to dog food when you have a open source project as in like eat the own, eat, use your project to actually build your own system. Uh, so if you go to 110.com slash docs slash copy, um, and I'm not looking at copy specifically, but that's just a, a file, right? So you'll see the documentation for how to use copy, the copy command. So what's powering that is there's a GitHub repo called 11 website. It's got a folder called docs, right? So that's where we get docs here. And then in there, we get a copy.md, which is how we get slash copy. And then in copy.md, we get something that looks like this. So this has some uh, templating language to make sure that 
we get like nice highlighting in what the material is that's presented. But generally speaking, you can read this and see that this is uh, marked down in, in format. Um, and they have some pretty advanced markdown here, right? I can have this triple, uh, triple dash and then JS, which is what gives this nice color coded part of the screen. That's a code block, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a code block. Um, yeah, the triple, triple dash lets you write code and it'll sanitize it to make sure it actually still presents it. Um, and this is not, unfortunately, Markdown isn't really a standard. It's kind of just a way people behave. So like there's nothing in the Markdown standard saying triple, triple um, back ticks and then the JS means to color code it as JavaScript. But yet that's a convention that's kind of emerged. So a lot of places if you do uh, that and then HTML or CSS, it'll do appropriate color coding in the content. Um, but this is part of why, I mean, that's a good example why someone would leave their material in a static file format like this. That will render in anything that renders markdown. Now it might not do the same color coding, it might not apply color coding at all, but you'll still get that block of material there. And it's free of all the connotations of the JavaScript libraries that would be required to make that do color coding. <laughs> um, so another reason people love Levity is it has this incredible data cascade layer. Um, so it actually walks, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go this deep with it, but it goes through these different file locations to basically come up with what the uh, data assembled for the pages. It has a really advanced data layer. Uh, so a flat file CMS, um, which is slightly different from static site generator, they could be the same, uh, but a flat file CMS is a data structure that is saved to and are called directly from the file system. So typically each page is modified as a single file on the file system. And you might say that sounds a lot like a static site generator. Bear with me, we'll keep going. So um, the names of the folders help determine the structure. Again, same. So the idea is shipping the entire site as a zip or git repo. Again, that sounds very similar. And there's no database by design. Wow, that sounds damn near the same thing. So um, let's look at how it's different in this case. So uh, getgrav.org is uh, for grav CMS. Um, it's, and it says, hey, open source flat file CMS. So grav CMS, and here's where your major difference comes in, is PHP based. So a flat file system driven uh, content management system doesn't necessarily mean it's static. So even though you're gonna get the homepage of Grav delivered to you, PHP actually ran behind the scenes to process and build the page dynamically and send it to you. This means subtle things are possible like being able to log in. A static site generator, those files are kind of prefabricated and now you have static, literal static HTML files. A flat, flat file CMS means that it uses the same type of structure, but you have a dynamic language powering it so you can actually do dynamic data presentation. So um, odd little detour, the founders uh, of Grav CMS uh, were some of the founders of Joomla, which was a much more popular CMS. We're not gonna cover it because I said much more. It, it was popular probably uh, eight, eight, 10 years ago and I, I don't have a ton of experience with it personally. Um, it uses Symfony, which is an abstraction framework I mentioned last week. Um, so I'd say Symfony is kind of comparable to Django, uh, Django being in Python land, Symfony being in PHP land. And it's used to improve security and the developer experience for people building things for the website. So um, it also provides a simple web editing interface. So if you choose to set up a grab site this week on Reclaim Hosting, because it's click a button, um, there is, you're going to get the name of my site, which is a folder, and then slash admin, which allows you to basically log into the website. Um, so there's your, your major difference between the static site generator and the flat file system. Um, you can zip a grab site and share it easily with others in the same way. It has uh, all changes that end up getting made are stored in a user folder. So you could actually just securely send someone a website by sending them the user folder, they could open a new copy of Graph CMS, dump in the user folder and get the exact same website. It's pretty cool. Um, so it is a little bit of an oddity because it requires PHP to run on a web server, um, but that allows you to do advanced processing on the fly, allows you to log in 
to the system and have that security layer. But it, unfortunately, it also requires you to have a server to run it. So um, 11D and Jekyll, there's a thing called GitHub Pages, and you can actually just like click a button and say, hey, GitHub, I'd like a website, and it'll turn those files into a real website. That's not possible with Grav, because Grav actually requires PHP to run, to execute, to build the page on your behalf. So Grav has a really slick admin UI. Um, personally, I'm going to be trying to copy some of these conventions for my own admin UI in my own system. Um, but so once you log in, you get this nice dashboard. Um, it's got a page outline editor. And so you can see exactly what the structure of your site is that you can modify. Um, reminder that these relate to actual physical files. So another cool thing you can do with Grav in reverse is you could actually go on the file system, make a folder called typography2, reload this page, and you're going to get typography2 showing up here because it's a physical file. It's not writing to a database to assemble this page. So then it has this nice little web editor, and sure enough, it edits Markdown because then the files are in Markdown and it's easy to preview Markdown. Everyone loves Markdown. I don't really know why. But um, so then you'd end up getting something like this as the output side. And we can see that typography shows up here in the menu because that's the name of the page, right? So it's leveraging that folder structure in this theme to actually create navigation and hierarchy. On the file system though, right? If I were to go and navigate to this file that we just edited, I have another sample graph site slash user slash pages. And then there's that 02.typography. In it, I've got my default.md. So even though I did that via the front end, I'm just touching this file. This is a huge reason people love this setup. Um, by contrast, we're going to look at WordPress next week. That in single insert is probably going to hit 12 database tables. Um, if this was Drupal, that single database insert is probably going to hit like 40 tables. And so the data, while highly relational and able to be presented in, in other dynamic ways, is kind of trapped away and locked into this, this uh, data structure that we've generated in the database. Versus this, right, I can relate to it on the front end. And in fact, in Grav, you can have certain pages that this YAML format actually presents the field on the front end, much like the Django app with the, oh, here's the field in the database, and this relates to this front end field in the user interface. So in this case, we see, well, because this has a title, Grav is able to say, oh, I should make an input field, and that's the value that goes there. So that when you save it, you are saving it kind of to a tuple or record associated with this page, even though it's, it's not just a blob of data, right? We're actually able to save data to individual records here. So um, with Grav CMS, then you could technically take all the pages and have the home page say, hey, make a river of news. And then every time you may add a new page to the system, it just adds another record to the list. Um, that's something you can do because Grav is treating the file system as data in this case. So then there's Hack CMS. Uh, so this is my baby. I, I made this kind of just screwing around one week in God, like 2018, I think. And then it kind of went out of control and it's consumed a lot of what we work on now. Um, so it's flat file. You can touch and edit anything just like Grav CMS. Um, it's, it's got its own data layer though, which is where it builds on top of Grav uh, called JSON outline schema. So it's a standard that we use to build out hierarchical content uh, using JSON. It's got a front end entirely written in web components, which is a actual technology standard we won't get into in this class, but I highly recommend looking into it. Uh, it uses the hacks editor to write static 8.html files. So um, I know only a couple of you are using hacks.psu.edu to do your blog posts, but if you fire up hacks.psu.edu, you can make your own little website and see what I'm talking about with hacks. It's like a, a reach out and touch things block editor uh, that our team works on. So it powers the course and, and other projects we work on. So there's some example sites and hacks. There's hackstheweb.org, which is all about the project. We have a menu hierarchy, flat design here. Uh, there's Hacks Camp because we were having national events prior to COVID. 
There's uh, sites that look nothing like any of the other ones that basically prove it's the system's flexibility. So um, if you're in Eberly College of Science, if you go to odl.science.pgu.edu, you can see this gorgeous website that they've been building in Hack CMS. Uh, there's btopro.com, if you can imagine who that might be, and my boring ramblings as a human. Uh, but that site is hosted off of GitHub. And then there's uh, IST402, which is the other course that I teach. And as a blatant advertisement for spring, I am now officially on the books teaching this um, Tuesday and Thursday next semester. So if you have IST402 as a requirement and you don't hate my guts, there's the blatant advertisement. Um, and then there's our IST 210 course. So uh, this course website is actually using a technology concept uh, known as headless. Has anyone heard the phrase headless before? There's one hand. What do you think headless is, Jonah? I've heard of it, but never looked into it. I need a drink. So <clears throat> I'd say headless is a approach to development that really, I, I started to notice people mentioning it in this way probably around 2015. And it's the idea that you're front end of your website is decoupled or headless from the thing that's powering the website. So it's not Frankenstein, even though I love this, this icon. I don't know why someone would make this icon, but it makes me very happy this exists. So headless development is effectively JavaScript load JSON, right? So that data structure with all the like, here's what the ID equals X, title equals Y kind of a thing. Um, and it has HTML based paths page reloads happen on the front end, meaning when you click a link for new data, JavaScript actually makes a request to the server saying, you've told me that this data is located at this file location, go get it. And so it doesn't, act, if you, you might notice, if you go to the course website, it has this little loading screen and then the website's there. It's actually loaded much more like a web application in general, like that you'd have on your phone. So you can install the course website, I believe. Uh, on your phone and have it show up on your home screen. But if you click around to different links, they'll load really quickly. If you hit refresh, you'll get the loading screen again. And that's because it's actually not reloading the entire website. It's making a request just for the pieces it needs, which is fundamentally different um, in headless development versus the other things that, um, that the other three sites that I showed. So in grab, you click the next button, it's gonna actually do a full request Backend does processing, here's your website. Every single page will do that. Uh, headless development is gonna send you JSON that represents the structure of the site, and then it's entirely on the front end to actually make that occur. Um, now, this has some potential negatives as well. We'll touch on, like there was a six hour window yesterday where I bricked all of Arts and Architecture's online courses. Yay, me and headless development. And even worse, that, that brick happened on the front end and it was cached in a CDN. So it meant that students that accessed the website for about a six hour range could break our website, but only on their computer. So that even after I fixed it, it wasn't actually fixed. So I say this anecdote because I actually did it and because I definitely still screw up, um, but also because this is a much more test laden approach. You have to really test what's going on with this because JavaScript and the end user is entirely responsible for loading the website, which is different than the server rendering the page and sending it to you each time. So um, this allows front end development teams and back end development teams to have a very clear line of separation. You basically act like the back end is gonna serve us API or um, uh, just the pieces of data we need for the website. So the front end team can build out these gorgeous looking websites and then say, oh, well, this area, this is where the title goes. And the back end team can go, oh, so you need an API that sends you a response that just has title as a field listed, right? So think of this as the same parallel to like SQL queries, where you structure that SQL query and you're only gonna get that data in question. Um, this is what decoupled allows us to do. And decoupled is, you know, the nicer term than headless. Uh, that it's the front end and the back end have clear lines of separation. So you can actually witness this in action with our course website. So if you right click uh, inspect, 
uh, on any web page, but especially on this web page, you'll see the network tab shows up there. It usually defaults to elements. And so if you click on network, you'll see the traffic going um, back and forth between the web server and your browser. You can do this on any website, but if we look at this page, so I clicked to load this page, we see that the front end tells the quote unquote back end just load, in this case, index.html, which is just this content, right? So think of this as that .md, that markdown file, right? But the front end is saying, hey, go give me that content. And it's just returning the guts that happen on the page. And this arrow points down for a reason, because if when you initially load the website, um, and if you actually watch to do the network transactions, you see it's several hundred kilobytes to ship to a user. Um, using a headless approach, you can make bullet fast websites. So to reload the next page, you see this says there were 844 bytes transferred. That's nothing to deliver a website. There's websites at this university that are several megs to load a single page. Um, so this is, hundreds if not thousands of times faster a development methodology than we were using when uh, when we were doing rear rendered websites and then you click and it has to rear render the next website and the next one and the next one so uh, you can actually see the data that's coming across that the front end consumes so if you go to another page or you reload um, and you click this XHR tab so XHR <laughs> remember why it's named that actually, but it, it's, it's short for AJAX request, which an AJAX request is like an asynchronous request for data. So if you use a web application and it feels really smooth and stuff loads quickly, it's because it's making AJAX requests uh, as opposed to reloading the whole site. So when I click on, when I reload the system, we can see there's a call for something called site.json. And this is actually gonna ship us all the detail of what is involved in this site as a data blob. So looking through that then, much like how Grav CMS had that YAML at the top of the file, right, that said title equals whatever, this is in Hack CMS, we're ending up getting all of the potential pages. So I think, did it, oh, it didn't say it, um, but the course website has like 100 pages. So it is actually going to send you 100 records to the front end. So that's why there is that loading screen on a lot of web applications that are built headlessly. It has to kind of preload references to all the data. So it's not loading the entire website, but it's loading the menu system because it needs to know what all the links are. So this data blob is enough then to tell the front end, hey, click, oh, go, hey, what's the location? Go get, and then it goes and gets this physical file, right? So we have the advantages of a system that is take, a, take the file off the file system, download it, zip it up and send it to you. But we've also got this really fast reloading dynamic aspect, which is what headless gives us. So in order to build headless applications, we had to write a, a standard. Um, now there are other ways of shipping data. This just happens to be the standard that we went with. Um, but so it's called JSON outline schema. Um, so it's a standard way of expressing the relationship between pieces of content. Um, this is also kind of our parallel to SQL. So if I wanted to do a select statement that said, give me all the pages and only these fields, we can kind of start to structure that system uh, using this technology. So it's, think of it as a JSON data, you know, array right here. So we've got this JSON data, it's got its different attributes, but what it's expressing is the relationship between items in a menu. And so Hack CMS leverages this to build the entire website out of thin air. Um, so if we look at one record in there, oops, there we go, or we look at three records in there, which is what's under items, they're gonna follow the exact same structure. So we went through this exercise of data normalization, right? Last week, this is what our team actually had to do to say, what is the minimum amount of fields and information we need to store to ship to a front end website to be able to convert it into a menu. And so in this case, we came up with things like, uh, yeah, like an item ID, right? And so this is, uh, this items section is an array of data blobs, but we can see that each of them has an ID, right? So there's item one, item two, item three. But then in item two, uh, item two and item three, they say that their parent is actually item one. 
So this is enough information to actually be able to assemble a front end that has hierarchy to it without sending this big hierarchy of data uh, you know, that's structured all the way down. This is a flat data structure that we can then reference between items using a simple key of parent in this case. So if I want to know what order they're in, and this was something we learned from playing with grab CMS, grab CMS has zero, one, dot, whatever. Oh, well, how do we reorder the pages? Oh, we have to rename the folders, which is kind of dumb to be perfectly honest. Um, but so what we said is, oh, well, we need something that declares order. So if we said, oh, well, the order is one, well, uh, one is gonna fall below zero, right? Because it's the order which you're counting. You're basically on this sliding scale. So that allows us to place these pages in a certain order. So the advantage of this approach and why we think this will be, uh, this is part of why we talk about it in the Emerging Technologies course is um, if anything serves JSON outline schema up, which is a standard we made, then no matter what that system is, Hack CMS can take that content and present it. So this is a bizarre behavior that is unique to our system. But so um, is anyone taking, if anyone's ever taken an online course and it looks like this, where you end up taking them, you take your arts classes online or um, in College of Science and they look kind of like this. Um, this is using a system called Elms Learning Network. It's actually built on top of Drupal Content Management System, uh, which we'll cover in two weeks. So it has this connotation of a node or like a page. And all a node is in Drupal is a title, much like Grav had, and a blob of data. So in this case, it's storing HTML. Well, if we, you know, again, opening up the, t the page and hitting reload, this is actually a headless page. So it's loading and it's kind of blank. You can actually see it because Elms is much older. It doesn't have a nice loading screen. Um, but it will load up kind of blank, then get its data and then loop through this JSON data and go, oh, here's the interface. Here's all the menu items. You can click and jump between them. And it's fed via JSON. So if we use that same content, but we serve it up in JSON outline schema, so this is the same website, but with Hack CMS sitting on top of it. So this is now not fed from a static web system. This is actually fed from a dynamic backend because Drupal's written in PHP, can actually see that there's JSON outline schema format. And that has 317 pages in it. And if I let the little animation loop back through, right? So yeah, so loop back through. That just loaded 317 pages in that instant. <laughs> Not all the content, but enough data structure for the front end of the website to go, oh, here's the, here's the menu hierarchy. So that when I click through it, it's making individual calls for just those pieces of material. So headless, you know, takes a lot longer. There's a lot more planning. It took us a solid year to actually get all of this stuff set up and deployed in a way that would be working. But now we have this unparalleled flexibility uh, where we can load content off of anything that we can make serve up this data format. So um, some of the pros of headless as a development approach, uh, it liberates the front end from the back end decision making. Um, that Drupal website that I showed um, is built on something called Drupal 7. Uh, Drupal 7, I believe, came out in 2010 or 2011, maybe. It's nearly unheard of to be running something in production for nine years in industry that hasn't changed. Um, Drupal 7 is out of date. There's now Drupal 9. If I don't want to migrate to Drupal 9, I no longer have that requirement of, of doing so because the front end experience my users are, are having doesn't care about what the back end is. That's what you get with headless in this case. So um, it allows for a documented API for improving the conversation between your front end and back end teams. There's also a cleaner separation of concerns as a result, right? So you can reduce the complexity in the back end system because uh, the front end doesn't care what server it runs on. Um, and uh, so there are definitely some cons to this and a lot of the industry has found this as well, at least in Drupal land. So it's very costly to build because of team requirement. When I say separation of concerns, that means you have to hire dedicated front end people and you have to hire dedicated back end people. Um, or I, I may have described myself in the first day of class that I'm a unicorn in this regard because I can actually build front end and back end application infrastructure. That's not common in industry. 
Um, so it can definitely extend project timelines. I heard people talking about like six, six months to a year for certain projects they were trying to pull off. Several large companies, including those building things like MSNBC website, not that one specifically, but things of that scale. Um, they kind of started down this headless way of building a website and had to back off because of team constraints. Um, these are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in decisions, which is why not everyone makes them. Um, so the other issue is, are you ever really decoupled? So relating to our, our SQL unit, if you had a, um, if you had a database table, there's um, geographic location. And I think a couple of people saw, oh, I've got risk and that has geographic location and it's USA. But then in geographic location, I don't really need to put USA, I need to do zip code, right? And you had to like change or do an alter statement. Um, so you've got these two tables. Well, the data in one table is completely dependent on the data in another, right? When you set up that primary key foreign key relationship. If you have to make changes to one of them because the key is wrong, you have to make changes to the other one because the key is wrong. And the same thing is true with a headlessly developed application. If our front end now needs another field to come across, the back end team has to actually make that happen. <laughs> so there are some question is like, is this just like a fun new way to develop things or is it actually more efficient or better, air quotes. So there's some other, other things out there as well um, that I would classify as hybrid static site generators. So this is a phrase I haven't seen anyone else use. This is kind of just the way that I'm describing this. So a hybrid static site generator is a system who loads Markdown or HTML files. Uh, it uses modern front end tooling to manage. It has JavaScript on the front end. It headlessly loads that material and it uses tools to fully, to, to write fully static content. So it's actually able to do both. It can have the advantages of um, at Levendy, where someone runs a script and your markdown file turns into a static web page, someone hits reload, the page is there. And it can then do the headless aspect of, and then you click to the next page and it actually goes and gets the, the content for it. So um, I don't know if I'm identifying a new form of this. I've just started to notice things moving this direction in the industry. But so Hacks Levendy is a, an example project um, that someone on our team started. It's a mashup of Hack CMS and 11D. And so uh, it's totally experimental. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but we do see some advantages to it. Um, so you end up getting Hack CMS with headless page loading that's super fast. So you can access the theme layer, you can use all the things that Hack CMS has access to. However, you still get all the aspects of 11D where it's statically generating pages which means you can integrate it with things like GitHub pages, workflows. Um, we won't talk about high SEO, but search engine optimization. When you have rendered uh, pages from a backend, they have high SEO, which means you show up higher on Google, you show up higher on Google, you make more money, right? So, um, and there's no backend processing language required. There's tooling involved, but you don't have like a live running web server. It can actually be static. So, um, you can learn more about that project at uh, elmsln.github.io slash slash hacks which is in itself demonstrating that the technology works. So this is a page delivered on GitHub pages, meaning that it's a static backend, it's just .html files. Yet when you click around to things, it's loading headlessly. And the way we were able to cheat and make this happen is when the tooling runs in 11D, it actually creates the headless backend files that Hack CMS needs to load. So it tricks Hack CMS into thinking it has a dynamic backend, even though it's just a physical file. So uh, in this case, we have Hack CMS's folder structure, which Hack CMS has all its content under pages, or sorry, under, yeah, under pages here. But 11D has all of its content under a folder called content. And so 11D then in there has static content. So I can see there's you know, three underscore in the word Y or post one, things like that. But then what 11D has done is it's made a two underscore install and it's, made, it's not just HTML, it's the whole web page is rendered into that file, which is what a static site generator is doing. Contrast that with Hack CMS, it has this pages structure where the data is just kept by itself 
for the content. So we've got these MD files like we saw in some of the other systems. And then when I look in one of those MD files, in this case, two underscore install.md, it's just the content by itself. So that's how, this is what I'm considering kind of a hybrid approach where you as a developer, if I wanna influence this page to have this text on it, I update a markdown file, but the system actually builds a full statically kept web copy. So there is another, and I, I know this isn't just unique in the universe to our work because um, Paul Hibbets, I mentioned at the beginning, he, he showed me this system he's been playing with a lot recently, uh, which is called Doxify. So you go to doxify.js.org, and again, that magical word keeps showing up because people don't want to explain what the hell is going on. But as much as I can discern from Doxify is it's markdown file driven, much like Eleventy or Jekyll, and it headlessly loads new content, much like Hack CMS does. So it's very easy to deploy, just going to the documentation. It's relatively new. I, I, I only started hearing about it in about the last four months. Um, and you can see an example of it. Uh, at, uh, Paul Hibbets has this, this nice boilerplate that starts to set it up. And the weird thing with it, if you actually inspect the source of what's on that page, it's just loading like four remote JavaScript files. Um, so it is actually just importing the whole system headlessly. And then when you have a markdown file, it actually loads the markdown file and then on the front end converts that into HTML. So it's an interesting approach. I don't honestly know a lot about it. So with that and gone through several ways that data can be structured in this static format, uh, we're into lab, lab six. Again, I haven't updated my business time photo. So uh, lab six is gonna have multiple options again this week. So pick the one that speaks to you. So all the CMS options involve creating and establishing a website using a CMS. So you're gonna be using one of the ones that we covered that I went through of this list. Um, don't worry, two of them can be installed in Reclaim Hosting. So if, you know, if you're not interested in playing with tooling, then those are still there. Um, so uh, all of them have the same scenario and base requirements. Uh, building the website itself is effectively the blog post. There's one page in the website that I want you to fill out certain information. Uh, consider that your blog post this week. So uh, then the video is subjective to the material in your option. So here's the scenario. Uh, you work for a paranoid boss who doesn't want a server that is running a database because it could get hacked. And now you are all aware of the way you're supposed to read trolley text. Okay, so when you're sarcastic, you're supposed to say it that way. So trolling aside, we'll just call him Chris, uh, wants you to review static and database list solutions in order to avoid SQL injection. Chris watched one of your videos last week and is now terrified of SQL injection. So Chris, which is definitely not the name of my boss at the place I work at Penn State, wants you to review open source publishing solutions that could help the team produce simple marketing sites easily. So Chris knows there are many options out there for building small websites statically and has heard of these hybrid solutions as well, but he, that's not his area of expertise. That's where you come in. So pick a CMS mention today and build Chris a site that has five pages on it in order to convince him to utilize this technology in the next project. So the five pages that you'll need as far as content supplied is page one should be an introduction to the community, supporting links, descriptive text, like what is this as a sentence, right? You know, if it's 11D, what the hell is 11D? Uh, the second is basic pros and cons of this solution, bullet list, right? So if that's, you know, all of these with one exception are written in Markdown. So if you consider Markdown to be a pro, then that would be a pro. Certain systems would actually consider that a con like Hack CMS. So then that shows up in your cons list. Um, three would be alternatives and why you actually like this one better. So, you know, play with them, especially a few, several of them, you should be able to play with in a, you know, five minutes or so to get enough of an impression of like, all right, this, I, this one speaks more to me. Um, then four is where the real writing is in, in this. So how this system structures data. 
explain how it manages a hierarchy of content, uh, screenshots and examples of the relationship between the website you're seeing and the file system is what we want to explore and make people aware of, right? Chris is paranoid that there's a database involved. We need to convince Chris, who's definitely not my boss, that it's not a big deal because it's not using SQL, and, but yet it's making a dynamic website. So uh, embed your video submission on page five. So that's all that's on the fifth page. So lab six in the how this system structures data option, right? So this is specific to the option. So if you pick Hack CMS, I wanna hear about JSON outline schema, flat HTML files, like what are the advantages of this? Try and talk through how it's loading this information and point to the parallels in the design you see. If you pick Grav, I wanna hear about PHP rendering the page for reading off the folder structure. How is it relating to the markdown files, the editing experience, et cetera? Uh, if it's Jekyll 11 d or Hacks 11 d which are kind of group all together, uh, you could throw Doxify there as well. I want a tutorial on how to get started with it, how you structured your site, how it interprets uh, the config files, it has YAML files that help inform its data structure. So in all of these, I wanna see the file system and the relationship to what a web page is on the other side, right? This is a data, like a data and organization of information course. We're trying to figure out how, organ how information organized on the back end can relate to information as presented in the front end of a website. So option one is install Hack CMS on Reclaim Hosting. Um, create a site with the described scenario. And then inspecting your site, making calls, explain the following. So how Hack CMS is headless, what, that, what headless means or decoupled, how the JSON outline schema standard enables the presentation of menus and hierarchies, like how those pieces are related, um, and just relating pieces of the UI to pieces of the schema, right? So I showed, loaded the page, there's this call that goes across, oh, here's where the item and the title is, five items came across, there's five pieces of content over here. How do those relate? Why do they relate? Option two is install Grav on Reclaim Hosting. Um, so create a site, describe the scenario. In your video, demonstrate the relationship between page editing, menu item creation, and how it ultimately relates to files on the file system, right? So another way you could do this to demonstrate this relationship would be showing adding a page either via the UI and then showing adding a page via the file system because you can actually just copy files on the file system in the right folder and you end up getting the front end website. Uh, add a new page directly from the file system without using the GUI as that line just says. And then option three, and I'd say this is more your like pro tooling route. Um, although honestly, if you're interested in web development at all, spend the extra you know, hour that this option probably takes to make sure that your computer can install this stuff. You can't run this directly on uh, reclaim hosting, although the output is static files. So you should be able to host it on either GitHub pages or you know, take the folder, zip it and unzip it on reclaim hosting, you have it on a website. So um, you will have to install one of these locally via tooling. If you have questions or issues about how to do that, that's part of my team's wheelhouse. So feel free to ask. Um, so your video should explain and demonstrate the relationship between content structure and the web page structure again, just like the other ones, um, and trace one page back to the original file uh, so the user follows a relationship, right? So that could be all the way from I edit this file, then I run this command, the tooling rebuilds the file, here's the output of what the file looks like as far as HTML structure, and here I, I have it on a website, and here it is when it's rendered. So submission, uh, how this system structures data serves as your blog post, right, as well as just making the five page site. So embed your screencast on page five of your site, uh, mention the option you selected, but it should be pretty obvious to me which one you did. And then submit a link uh, into the Lab 6 flat file CMS channel on Slack. This is hopefully going to point primarily to not, you know, this isn't going to point to like a dev.2 post as most of you have been doing. This is going to post to like your reclaim hosting account slash grab or whatever. Uh, so this is again due by Sunday, 11.59. Uh, rubric for this week. So uh, the website is created using the CMS from this week. Two points. How is this system structure data? Accurately portrays how the system actually handles data based on your context. And then demonstration of technique in video based on whatever option. 
Uh, so there is also bonus this week. I don't, I, the CMS weeks, at least this one in Drupal will have bonus because I don't know WordPress that well to generate a bonus for it. But um, so if you want an extra 25%, uh, go the extra mile on this one. So for option one with Hack CMS, add a specialized web component, um, which is listed. There's a thing that says add content. So add one to each of the five pages uh, in question. Then in Grav, I want you to install the Hacks plugin, which is our team's editor, uh, and try to edit a page with and without the Hacks plugin to see the difference in how it's managing this information. Uh, if you're using Hacks Levendy or the static site generators, um, use GitHub Actions to set up a workflow that automatically rebuilds the site with new content. So in the video for each, if you want to extend this and do the bonus, try to explain how Hacks uses the DOM as an API to store data. This is not something we're going to really cover in class, um, other than at some point I will show the way that we're using the DOM as data, I believe for lab nine, when we talk about XAPI. Um, but try to use the Hacks editor and relate it to the content it's storing and figure out how, you know, talk through why it's fundamentally different than storing data in a database. So um, last real quick, uh, installing Gravel and Reclaim Hosting, it's right hit you in the face. You hit the space man and you can go through and make the file, which then if you hit file manager, then you should be able to find it in public HTML. In this case, you see I have it named Grav CMS. And then I could step through and find the physical file that's being written to, right? That's the relationship between those two. So uh, if you're installing Hack CMS on Reclaim Hosting, you have to dig a little bit. You click all applications. And then there's this goofy snowflake looking thing that says Hack CMS. Um, and then you should get some silly login like this. Um, when you install it, it'll give you a pat. It'll say like, what's your password? So remember what the password is and that's what the login is in both instances. Grab does the same thing. So similar uh, hack CMS would then be on your public file system in reclaim under hack CMS or whatever you name the project. And then uh, there's a config directory that has your password if you forget it. Um, but all the pages are actually located under uh, no, no, it's in, it's in config. We'll go, I'll go into it in lab on Thursday. Uh, so looking ahead, we're going to be reviewing some database-backed CMSs, right? This is a major detour to see something that's con completely contrasting. So uh, next week, we're going to look at WordPress, and the week after that, Drupal. Um, people have full-time jobs doing all of these. So like, especially if you're early in your college career, it wouldn't kill you to be involved with like clubs or whatever and manage their website. Um, I got a lot of Drupal experience in undergrad doing uh, the roller hockey website because I played roller hockey and I was able to quickly roll that into employment, uh, even just doing part-time work at the university. Um, so Jekyll, WordPress, Drupal, Grav, Eleven D, like these are real world skills that companies are looking for um, and that you can use to build your own web presence. So I highly recommend you invest some time in them even outside of here. Um, and then keep in mind these concepts and lessons we learned um, this week, especially as we go in, back into the SQL driven CMSs. So that we're at about time on uh, Thursday. I'm going to show installing some of these things. Um, if anyone wants to see like how to install Levendy, play with it, how to understand the file structure, those types of things. Um, so we're closed. Anyone have any questions? Otherwise we get to cut it here and then see you Thursday. Boop.